Water on Mars? Not a dream anymore. Join us as we explore NASA's groundbreaking plan to tap into the red planet's hidden oasis. Attention all space enthusiasts! Ever wondered if there's water on Mars? Forget rover collecting dust, NASA is going in for the big dick. We're talking miles deep to extract precious resources and unlock the secrets of the red planet's watery past. In today's video, get ready for Red Water, a next-gen drilling machine that could change everything we know about Mars. But before starting the video, if you if you are new to our channel, do subscribe to it and also press the bell icon so you will never miss any updates in the future. Let's start the video. NASA's new approach to Mars exploration will enable them to delve far into the red planet's ancient past and find the precious minerals concealed beneath its surface. A massive drill is being sent to Mars. The Red Water robotic drilling equipment from Honey Bee Robotics has completed end-to-end -end testing and is prepared to be deployed on the upcoming Mars missions. The California-based business develops innovative of technology for space exploration in collaboration with NASA's next phase of two grand partnerships. To reach the layers of water ice that observation satellites have been able to detect on Mars over the past 10 years, they have designed and constructed a sizable, sturdy cold weather drill that can dig down more than 25 meters. The most demanding testing was carried out in chambers created to mimic the bitterly cold Martian surface. The hybrid systems that comprise red water's drill hardware were tested using both supercooled ice and simulated soils. It is difficult to dig in a northern region during the winter, as anyone who has tried will attest. It can be difficult for even highly powered instruments to pierce the cement-like consistency created by the soil's water freezing below a particular threshold. The lower the temperature descends, the greater the effect. The Phoenix lander discovered almost comparable conditions in 2008 with an average temperature of about minus 60 degrees Celsius when it landed at the Martian North Pole. Mars can experience temperatures as low as minus 128 degrees Celsius or 262 degrees Fahrenheit, which is far colder than the ground, which was once frozen solid. The same technology that scientists use on Antarctica's soil and ice, where temperatures can drop as low as 88 degrees Celsius or 190 degrees Fahrenheit, was used to build this crimson water system. The first system uses a drilling technique known as CT or coiled tubing. It is comprised of a drill head fixed to a flexible but robust robust metal tube that may be inserted into the borehole in a few different ways. A series of rollers is used by red water to compress the tube and force it down the hole. The actual drill bit is housed in the drill head, which is also referred to as a bottom hole assembly. However, it also houses the pressurized air system for clearing debris that could block the drill and the motor for operating it. Though the CT approach is required to accomplish the majority of the job here, scientists are quite convinced that solid water ice will be discovered after the first 20 meters, which is where the second method begins. However, this technology is only effective in soil. The Rodriguez well, often known as the red roll technique, is this. It is a tried and true technique for breaking through difficult oil old ice and is frequently utilized in Antarctica to maintain subsurface bee holes. To ensure that there will be a layer of solid ice at the roof of the new well to prevent impurities from the earth from getting in, a small cavity is created at the top of the ice by a drill rather than drilling all the way through. The ice is then melted into a sizable well and the resulting water is pumped back out while keeping the water level at a suitable level for use. The honeybee engineers think that even in the warmer equatorial regions, their red water machine should be able to produce reliable wells for use by Martian colonies using both techniques. The drill itself is meant to be as efficient as possible and has been built to go into a very bare bones rower that packs up into a hexagonal container. According to engineer briefs from 2019, the robot's sizable deployable solar panels ought to be able to supply all of the electricity required for the drilling, heating and pumping tasks. Redwater can produce hydrogen rocket fuel, which is the project's ultimate goal, and drinkable water thanks to pneumatic tests that demonstrate its ability to use both compressed Martian air and rocket fuel components made from the water itself. This machine could be somewhat self-sufficient. More information than just minerals and water would be obtained from drilling on Mars, it would paint a much clearer picture of a planet with flowing water. Right now, testing red water is the top priority for groups of these robots to dig wells and construct a habitable base on the planet's surface, but the scientific discoveries made possible by being able to go deeper than humans have ever been able to would be tremendously valuable. 
Redwater is fortunately capable of doing all of these tasks simultaneously. The Chinese military has started training commercial satellite contractors for orbital refueling exercises, according to a report released by the US Air Force on March 18th. Plans are being developed for both peacetime and wartime logistics operations. Regardless of the political situation on the ground, the People's Liberation Army has been making sure that they can refill crucial Chinese satellites in terms of basic mechanics. The PLA has reportedly been working on simulations and even doing tech demonstrations in an attempt to incorporate frequent missions of this kind into their responsibilities to adequately prepare for this, according to the article. This is similar to the satellite maintenance task that NASA shuttlecraft used to perform. In reality, the US has been actively investigating several firms that could be able to develop new vehicles that can essentially perform the same function that the PLA is attempting to figure out, which is to propel older satellites into more useful orbits to extend their operational lifetime by refueling. The PLA had first raised the issue of the Chinese government's requirement to be able to sustain its satellites under any circumstances in their textbook discussions back in 2013. Then, in 2018, the Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology started showcasing their on-orbit petrol station, a service craft with deployable solar panels and arms with gripping mechanisms that might be used to lock the refueling module to a satellite was depicted in the vehicle's design brief. The early designs here, according to the Air Force report, are reportedly replicas of a Northrop Grumman idea. However, the state-run China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation launched the CN-21 satellite in 2022 and it succeeded in moving a retired spacecraft onto a higher graveyard orbit, demonstrating China's increased capacity for equipment maintenance in orbit. The Air Force is not concerned with the Chinese military rearranging some space debris. It is evident that the report that the Air Force has a modest level of concern regarding the potential of a Chinese orbital robot engaging one of their satellites in a surprise attack. According to the article itself, in the unlikely event that these grappling vehicles make a run for a US satellite, they may be easily tracked and avoided due to their size. This idea does, however, detract from the actual issue. The United States is likewise lacking in ensuring that, in the event of a conflict with a nation possessing the capability of space travel, they can maintain uninterrupted service for their satellites. Commercial contractors are being used by both China and the US to assist in the initial deployment of their infrastructure. That appears like more and more military activity is taking over our orbit when you combine that with Russia's recent anti-satellite action, which the US was able to observe. Firefly Aerospace has been contracted by the Pentagon's Defense Innovation Unit to do a feasibility study on their novel orbital transfer vehicle called Elitera. Announced in August of last year, Elitera is a reconfigurable support vehicle meant to meet any customer's demands while in orbit. As stated by Firefly, Elitera can accomplish this from here to the entire lunar sphere. This includes initial deployment into the orbit of your choosing, as well as the capture and management of craft that are already in space. The ability to swiftly and dependably transport vehicles and things across low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, and as far out as the moon is necessary is what the DoD is interested in. Firefly claims that the Elytra were created utilizing several systems from its Blue Ghost Lander, including a carbon composite construction as well as flight technology from its Alpha launch vehicle. Additionally, they specifically mention learning from the Sherpa space tug that Spaceflight Industries developed after buying them out. Currently, Elytra is available in three standard loadouts. One of them, Elytra Dawn, can be hired for quick servicing in low Earth orbit, suggesting that it can deploy considerably faster than the other configurations. The Elytra Dusk resembles the Blue Origins Blue Ring vehicle more, perhaps because it is designed to be able to maneuver out to geostationary orbit. Last but not least is the much more sturdy looking Elytra Dark, which reportedly enables transfers from low Earth orbit to the moon and beyond. This is probably a reference to D's design request to be able to reach the entire geostationary orbit, which extends to the Earth-Moon Grange points on the far side of the lunar orbit. Firefly was hired under the Defense Innovation Unit's Synquant project, which started in 2022 and required proposals from 94 firms totaling 112 to solve the Department of Defense orbital infrastructure issue. Getting hired does not ensure that you will make the right choice. 
To move forward, Firefly must now show off the capabilities of their vehicle with the combined launch and orbital transfer in less than 18 months after receiving proposal. If they are successful, Firefly will be hired to produce 3 to 6 Elytra cars, at least one of which will be able to reach the moon and they will be able to reduce the time it takes for the manufacturer to launch by doing so. That's a lot of pressure and the DIU will probably be considering offers from other businesses concurrently but Firefly has experience doing business with the US military department. They finished the Air Force's Victus launch in September of last year. Under comparable circumstances, fulfilling the launch order in less than 27 hours, including payload fitting, fueling and launch preparations. Although Alicia may be a more ambitious effort, Firefly appears to be up to the task.